Welcome to the Revision Path podcast, brought to you by Revision Path, a showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. I'm Maurice Cherry, and this week concludes our design journey series where we talk with designers that have been interviewed and profiled for AIGA.org. This week's interview is a real treat. I have the extreme honor and privilege to speak to Emery Douglas, the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party from 1967 to the 1980s. Emery is truly an American design legend. Here we go. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Emory Douglas, and I'm a, a graphic artist and a former activist in the Black Panther Party from 1966 to, uh, excuse me, from 1967 until uh, 1980, 81. Uh, I, I do uh, artwork dealing with social issues, so social commentary. Okay, and I, I certainly want to want to go into what you've done with the Black Panther Party, but just to sort of go back a little bit, uh, doing my research, I know that you're originally from from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, uh, when yeah, did you I, sort of make the move from Michigan to California? Well, I came to uh, from Michigan to California when I was uh, about seven or eight years old. I was born in 1943 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I had asthma as a kid, but I grew it over many years. And uh, but, but the doctor thought it would be the weather would be climate would be better in California. And my mother had a had a sister who lived in San Francisco, California. So uh-huh. we headed this way in 1951. Oh wow! Okay, was was the weather better for your for your asthma? Uh, well, I don't know if the weather would know. I just outgrew it when I got about 18, 19 <laughs> years old. <laughs> okay. It just didn't happen. It just it went away. <laughs> right. My my uh, my older brother, he still has asthma, but uh, yeah. my family's from, from Alabama, and it's funny because they moved to Detroit for mm-hmm. kind of a similar type of thing. It was like a health issue thing, and they thought yes. that moving up north would have improved that. So, yes. so that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I did have a dad uh, even here when I was a kid, but I just out some over a period of time, it just went away. Okay. Did you have a very uh, creative childhood? Well, no, I, I would say no different than any others who, just like any other child, it likes to play with uh, pencils and draw on uh, uh, scratch paper or what kind of paper you can find. Uh, uh-huh. Marker, that kind of stuff, but nothing, uh, nothing more creative than that. Okay, and your family encouraged that? Pardon me? Did your family? Did they encourage it? They didn't. Well, say, not, like, my, no, my mom home? was single. Fa- my mom was single pa- uh, fa- fa- parent, uh, but she okay. was legal. She was legally blind. She could. See oh, okay. She could see something, but uh, it was some, but by the, the standard of what she could see, she was considered legally blind. Uh huh. Oh wow! I have, uh, I have an uncle who. He runs a store. He's also he's like blind, like fully yeah. blind. But he runs a, a store. He ran this store. I remember when I was a kid, and people would always try to pull one over on him and trick him when he's trying to like take stuff off the shelf because he knew where everything was. He had a system. And, yeah, yeah, same. and all of that. Yeah, that was the same with my mom. She went all the way blind later on in life, the latter part mm-hmm. of her life. But yeah. So leading up to to the time in the in the Panther Party, uh, tell me what happened when you were around fifteen years old. Uh, that's cut off a little bit. I didn't hear part of your question. You clicked in and clicked out. Oh, I'm sorry. Tell me about what happened when you were, were 15 years old, uh, when you were in California. You were incarcerated. Is that right? Uh, yes. As a youngster, I was incorrigible in and out of the youth detention centers uh, during that period. Uh, but, of course, I've never been arrested for anything as an adult except for political uh, activity. And mm-hmm. so, but, but during that period, uh, and the day and time, I was in and out, and I... Uh, uh, I think that there, uh, I used to uh, uh, draw a lot on paper, you know, watercolors, nothing nothing that had to deal with it, figure drawing, and nothing had to deal with any, uh, any politics, just like landscape art, those kinds of things, mm-hmm. uh, using watercolors and stuff like that. And so um, uh, that experience uh, was what I usually do to pass the time while I was there, incarcerated during, the, during that period. And then from there, you went on to the City College of San Francisco. Uh, yeah, I went over to City College of San Francisco. Um, I was encouraged to, when I was going to go to City College by the mm-hmm. counselor. One of the counselors at the youth detention center suggested that I take up artwork. And uh, it's uh, ironic. My mother used to was working at the youth det- at the juvenile hall. They had, oh wow! Uh, yeah, they had the uh, they had these concession stands 
for the handicap, which you had in the state of California, and all all state and federal and, and local government buildings then. And mm -hmm. so she worked for the lady who was, who ran the stand there early on, and she took it over later, uh, who was blind. And they ran the concession stand for the uh, for the uh, probation officers and those who had family and friends, a loved one, young kids who were incarcerated. They would come see them, and they would come through there. So that's how I began to know so many people in California, in San Francisco, because mm -hmm. in the low-income uh, areas of the city, you had a lot of young people as now who were incarcerated. Mm -hmm. and so um, I, when I went to City College, I did uh, ask my counselor uh, about uh, uh, about uh, taking up art, and they suggested I take up commercial art, mm -hmm. and which was a blessing because when you took up the, uh, commercial advertising art. Uh, you were introduced to many different aspects and disciplines. You, uh, you figure drawing. Uh, uh, you were also uh, design, lettering, uh, the printing prospect aspects of uh, art, production aspect of it. Also, you were critiqued. Your art was critiqued against that which was be done on a professional level. Uh, so you had all these things going on. You had to be able to analyze. Uh, uh, finished pieces of work like publications or magazine covers or any kind of design. You had to mm -hmm. be able to uh, analyze and explain how it was put together. So it gave you an in-depth understanding of all those things. And, and also you did uh, um, some basic uh, uh, animations, uh, two-minute animation, uh, cartoon series, uh, drawing series that you uh, on a subject that you chose during that time mm -hmm. as well. Now you also had some pretty... Uh some pretty famous classmates, too, at least famous in terms of what I think uh, Americans know of and, and right around the Civil Rights Movement. You did set design for Amiri Baraka, who was Leroy Jones then, but you did set design for him, too, right? Uh, yeah, well, what happened, uh, I was out at City College at the time, and they uh -huh. talk about all the cultural activity that was starting to, to uh, starting to happen out at San Francisco State, which was about a 15-minute a uh Bus ride, bus ride, or you could go by car and about get in about five and five minutes, five ten minutes. And so um, I used to go out there quite a bit. I, people used to think I I went to San Francisco State because I was out there so much. And when they mm -hmm. brought Amiri Baraka out there, the, uh, the ethnic studies department then was the Black Student Union and connected with the Black Student Union then. They uh, they hadn't come to do community theater, street theater, and I had been involved at that time before the Black Panther Party in the Black Arts Movement in San Francisco. And so when they brought him to to there, uh, they had him to play, you know, community theater. And so I asked him about doing the props. I was introduced to him, and I asked him about doing the props for the uh, for his uh, for the plays and stuff. And so they were basic, simple backdrops. And, uh, and I used to travel with him quite a bit uh, to when he was through the different uh, theatrical performances at, at universities and in the community. Now, was he sort of your, or I guess doing the work for him, was that sort of your introduction to the party, or was the party just a, a known entity because of how you know, society sort of was back then? Well, I had been hanging around Elmira Barack, and he was giving me a great history lesson on African-American, African history, and what okay. have you. But at the same time, uh, there was a, uh, an event that was being planned, and because I had been doing, uh, using my little experience that I had at City College and graphic experience, and I had been making flyers and doing little uh, artwork in uh, in the black arts movement, I was asked by some activists who were out at San Francisco State, among others, would I come to this meeting that they were having. And when I went to the meeting, they were talking about bringing Malcolm X Widow to the Bay Area to honor her. Okay. And they said it was some guys who were going to come over a couple of weeks later. Uh, they had asked to do security, and they would let them know and when they came over. So when they did come over, uh, it was Huey Newton and Bobby Seal. And mm -hmm. uh, so after that, they agreed, and after that meeting, I went out and asked them how could I become a part of the organization. Um, because this is, you have to understand, at this period in time, there was, uh, as you have today, you had... Uh, a lot of police abuse and murders of African American, young African American men, boys being shot and murdered, and I was uh -huh. being justified. And a lot of rebellions, a lot of riots during that time. So many young people respected. It. You had the civil rights movement in the South. Many people respected that, but some just didn't want to turn the other cheek at that time. So they wanted to do other things beyond that. And so uh -huh. I was one of those. And so uh, they gave me their uh, phone number and address. So I used to call uh, 
with Huey, and I made arrangements to come over. And I used to catch the bus because I didn't have a car then from San Francisco to Oakland, and I would hang out at his house. This is early January, end of January 1967, going into February 1967. Okay. So uh, this is, begins my transition into the Black Panther Party from the Black Arts Movement. All right. Were you the only designer for the party, or were there other people? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, and, and, and initially, I was. What happened is how it all started as a designer. It started through the Black Panther Party uh, political organ, the newspaper itself. The mm-hmm. first, the first one was done April second. That was Bobby Seale on a leaflet, eleven by eight and a half by eleven legal size uh, leaflet that they had typewriter typed on a typewriter, uh, and Bobby Seale had done the mask here with markers and things like that. And so what happened one evening, uh, I came by a place where we used to have a lot of cultural events in San Francisco. And Bobby and Huey were there because Elgis Cleaver was a person who they were trying to recruit to be the writer for the newspaper. And he lived there upstairs, and the, all the cultural activity went on downstairs. And so Bobby was working on that particular flyer uh, when I got there. And I'd seen what he was doing, and I told him, well, I got some few materials, which I had left over from City College, like uh, rub-off type and all those kinds of things, uh, and uh-huh. make headlines and stuff that I could go get them and uh, come back and, uh, you know, and he said, okay. And so when I came, it took me about a half an hour to go and a half hour to get back. And so uh, when I got back, he said they were surprised that I came back and that I came back with my material, but he said they were finished with that paper. But they had planned to start a newspaper, and they wanted me to be the revolutionary artist because I've been coming around, hanging around, and seeing committed, so they were going to have this whole vision about the paper and they wanted me to be the first title with revolutionary artist for the Black Panther newspaper. And so that was my first involvement. Uh, and the first paper came out in uh, around uh, May 2nd, uh, uh, 1967. And uh, the first three, four issues was basically I was using my skills as a production artist, doing layout, those kinds of things. It was on-the-job training because I had minimum uh, knowledge, experience. I did have work experience at City College much because I had developed my skills to the point where they would send me out on jobs. So all that played a part into um, when I went, when I counted into the Black Panther Party, using those skills uh, in regards to help develop it in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, aesthetics and the, uh, of the newspaper itself. It was about, uh, I could say about uh, the first... Uh, Six months or so, uh, I did 99%. I did most of the art. As a matter of fact, I, you could say throughout the party, I did about 85% of all the artwork. But there was still a large volume of the work that was done by others, some who had greater skills than I did as artists, but didn't have the, didn't have the insight at that time how to integrate the politics of the social commentary into their artwork that would be focusing from the standpoint of what the Black Panther Party was trying to put across. So that was became my responsibility. And and you have a very distinctive style. It's sort of a, a kind of a woodcut style, but you also mentioned before that you uh like use rub off ties and mimeographs and stuff like that. Was the style mostly influenced by the material that you had to work with or is that just sort of your personal style that you cultivated? Well, you could say combination both. It's more cultivation also as well. Um, uh-huh. uh, it was a, a style that I used a lot when I was trying to put a portfolio together and presenting stuff work in City College. But, of course, it said, told me that the style was not a commercial style. Therefore, you you know, you, you, it, would, it wouldn't be advisable to use that for your portfolio. So, you know, you got this standard way that they do for commercialized art, illustration, or what have you. And so I I put that to a side, uh, and but when I came back into the black when I got into the Black Panther Party, I came back to those styles, which was more more simpler, easier for me to deal with. And so and uh, um, I began to the woodcut styles came about because of uh, I used to like woodcuts, but uh, mm-hmm. trying to do them took so much time. So I began to begin to mimic woodcuts by using markers and uh, pens and all, whatever material, uh, sketching material I had to uh, play with shadows and shapes and forms to get the wood cut, cut effect. So off of that style, I began, I could do the various dim, dim, different uh, types of styles. But that's how I uh, began to develop that, that whole bold uh, woodcut kind of uh, uh, art that you've seen that was uh, uh, people I identify with myself. 
How often did the paper circulate? Was it a monthly paper? Well, initially, if it came out sporadically, it was supposed to come out on on a, every two weeks to a month. But mm -hmm. as we had growing pains, uh, we had limited uh, resources all the time, most of the time, and we had limited staff in the beginning. So uh, I was basically the only one. Uh, me and John Seal, Bobby Seal's brother, initially started working on the paper because he had some uh, uh, some layout skills, production skills. Then mm -hmm. uh, came myself, and then there was another the one young lady named Tarika Lewis who worked with me, the first woman uh, in the Black Panther Party, one of the first women in the Black Panther Party. We worked together. She was an artist and now a well-known jazz musician. But uh, in those days, um, uh, it came out uh, very sporadically until about the latter part of, you could say, 1967, 68, 67, early 1968. Then we began to develop a more consistent schedule until we got a, a, a schedule together that where it came out on a weekly basis. Okay. And so you're doing pretty much new illustrations every week after that, leading up until... I guess when the when the party sort of disbanded, is that right? Oh uh, yeah. Sometimes I would, and sometimes I would remix images from time to time. Then there was also the contribution of the other artists. After we called each one teach one that we had. I would teach uh -huh. them everything I had over a period of time, so that if, then then they would be able to in, integrate their work into the paper as well. So it was my I became like the uh, the art instructor. In, mm -hmm. in relationship to those who work with me at, at various times throughout the uh, production of the paper. But, uh, yeah, every week uh, yeah, we would try to do something on a weekly basis, be consistent. In the beginning, uh, the quality of the work uh, was uh, not that good because of the lack of materials and sometimes sometimes my, uh, in, not, not, my, uh, not clarity on how to apply it for reproduction, the artwork. Uh, but coming back, evaluating and critiquing it, uh, over, uh, was able to improve it uh, to a, a certain standard uh, that we could over a period of time. That was I, I, I really like what you said about kind of the each one, teach one sort of uh, mm -hmm. mentality when it came down to putting the, the design together. One thing that I found when I, when I interview people is that there seems to be a lack of mentorship. Well, let me put it this way. There's a lack of mentorship in the design space when it comes to sort of giving you the opportunities for what you need to do or at least showing you a lot of different things that you can do based on your craft. And I mean this specifically for, for black artists. There's kind of a lack of mentorship there. Did you have any mentors when you were, uh, say, for example, at City College or even when you were in the party? Did you have any people that sort of helped you along the way and kept you motivated, or was it just the sort of spirit of the party that kept you going? I think it was more the spirit of the party because I was the graphic designer in the party at the time, uh -huh. and there was no other ones there that had that skill or ability at that time. Because you have to understand, we're talking about 1960s, when you had very, you had, and particularly, you didn't have very many blacks who were into the commercial art field. They, they, uh, on, a, on a mass level, maybe some of the publication magazines that you had that were geared towards the uh, the, 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 uh, the petty bourgeois or something like that, you seen those kinds of magazines. Uh, and you had people who worked with them, or you had uh, black newspapers who were mainstream newspapers or stuff like that. But uh, on an activist level, or working on where I was, you didn't have that kind. You didn't have that. You didn't have that many uh, African Americans. So uh, young people who came in came in as artists, but not as artists who had the. Uh, the, the came in as uh, didn't have the, the, the skills in relationship to the production skills mm -hmm. that were needed to mass produce and volume and that kind of stuff. You know, those things. So the party sort of disbanded in like the late seventies. Early um, 80s. No, yeah, early 80s. Early 80s? Yeah, about 1981, 82, around there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what did what did you sort of do right after that? What what were your plans after after the party? Well, well during that time, what happened, to put that in a in context, um, during, we used to be close to uh, an African-American newspaper owner named Dr. Carlton Goodman, who was a very civil rights activist, mm -hmm. who uh, owned the newspaper, a black newspaper in San Francisco. And they used to always publish a lot of stuff about the Black Panther Party. They were in solidarity with what, what was going on and the issues that we were confronted with on a daily basis, social programs, police abuse, all those things. And so what happened is that uh, when they were upgrading their first um, typesetting equipment, we were able to buy their equipment from them. 
And so thereafter, uh, during that whole duration of the party, latter part, they used to have some problems now and then with staff. And 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 I would got I worked it out where I could send people from my production uh, department where I was responsible for in the party to work with them in regards to the Sun Reporter. So they knew of my work and what I had been doing all the time. So when the party uh, uh, demise in party demise in 1981. Uh, they got in touch with me and wanted me to come to work with them at the Sun Reporter newspaper, uh, which I did. And I worked there okay. until 2004 uh, doing uh, production work, layout, stuff like that, and illustrations in accordance to what they wanted for the newspaper. Okay. Now, with what you did at the Sun Reporter, did you sort of find your role was similar to that of the party in terms of that kind of each one teach one mentality? You were kind of uh, yeah, mentoring to, and overseeing yeah, other things. Yeah, to, to, yeah, to a degree, because they, the Sun Reporter was a paper that would hire people who needed a job. A lot of times people come in, they didn't have real production jobs. Even the mm-hmm. production manager, I think, learned his skills on the job, but they were still uh, skills to the point of where it could have been, it was improvement and stuff like that. So I think that... Uh, Coming in and to the, in that environment over a period of time, I was able to assist with the uh, improvement in the format and uh, give us of, uh, of, the, of the paper itself, design of the paper itself. Okay. And you so said you left through, Yeah, and that was working with others. Of course, you you know you have you don't you, you de- now you're dealing with the whole enough and different uh, uh, dynamics as opposed within the party. You're dealing with a lot of people who come in with the individual attitude and you know the work ethics have to be developed. All those things, as far as we're in the organization, it, we were living collectively, and over, after a period of time, uh, having c- c- critiquing and evaluating our work consistently, uh, whether uh, in regards to how the paper looked and the, all those things. So mm-hmm. you're dealing with another thing of a, people coming in with a, a five, a, a eight hour mindset, uh, going home and the whole bit and take care of her family and the whole, all those things. So, so you're dealing with a whole other individual kind of uh, uh, set up as opposed to the Black Panther Party in regards to that uh, each one, each one. Mm-hmm. I, I want to go back to that, that eight-hour mindset because <laughs> yeah. I think that's important. Uh, oh, what did I want to ask about? Um, okay, so you left the paper in, what did you say, 2004? Uh, no, it was 2000. Yeah, 2004, yes. Uh-huh. 2004, okay. So it's, it's been about, I guess, 10 years since then. I know you're still making art too, is that right? Oh yeah, yeah. I was making art while I was in the in there. I may be, maybe want me to do a portrait or images of, of uh, something for the newspaper from time to time. Or then there was the uh, National Black Press, which wanted me to do a, a, a whole a whole a whole. Uh, I mean, about twenty five or thirty sketches that they had set up for their website on on histories and black and and, and his black blacks in history and stuff like that. So I was always doing some form of art, but yes, but I became, got back to uh, doing a lot of the uh, stuff that I've done recently about 2004, 2005. Because also uh, during that time from about 1994, 95, uh, my mom, my stepfather got sick. And so I, he got chicken diabetes, so I had to come over and help my mom. So I had to focus on that. Then after she, he got, after he passed away in the 2003, 2004, then she got sick, and so I had oh, to. Oh wow! Yeah, and so she, then she passed off. So that means from two, for about 13 years straight, there I was focusing on that here, uh, mm-hmm. but I was playing around with my artwork a little bit here, uh, but I wasn't doing anything but playing with techniques and stuff like that. And uh, so it was thereafter that I began. To, she passed on that I was because there were a lot of requests. During that time, for me to do presentations and come and all kinds of stuff, but I just couldn't do it because of uh, having to manage the things here at the house. And my step, my son, and my and my daughter both had their own families to take care of. It was very limited things that I could do at that time. Mm-hmm. And so when they passed on, it's just at about that same time, uh, the art book came out uh, on my artwork, and so that and then the exhibit at MoCA in L.A. And then from there, uh, the man started coming, and then you know, all all up until up through that time, I began doing. Been I got back and focused on doing a lot of the artwork that uh, I've done since then. Over about, I've remixed some, got into integrated some of the artwork into the computer. While I do the artwork uh, and maybe line drawings and maybe paint some of it on the computer, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and, and enhance some things or retouch uh, paintings that I got files on and 
uh, want to clean them up or change some colors or things like that with the computer. So I got uh, those things. Uh, so that's what I, you know, in regards to the artwork itself and to continue on with the uh, development of artwork, which I'm doing right today, matter of fact. Okay. So, and, and it's interesting because you, you really came uh, into your own as an artist a lot earlier than really this whole digital computer age right now. I think a lot of designers these days are really dependent on that. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just sort of part of what the industry is now. They're dependent on having the software and the programs and the devices to kind of guide their creative uh Notion, but those are really just just tools, you know. Yes, yes. That, you know, you shouldn't really rely on that kind of as a crutch. But it's good that you said that you're you're kind of leaning into doing some digital stuff now to to supplement and augment what you what you've already worked on. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. Well, and it become out of necessity, you know, because I was when I was going <laughs> at first started off in regards to uh, uh, when I would travel and I would showing my sli- I would show slideshows, but I had the old slide projector. And uh-huh. then people would say, well, we don't use that too, no more. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to figure out how to get people people who get, who I knew who were into the uh, digital age to uh-huh. assist me in develop, understanding the process, which I got my computer uh, about 19, 2000, 2007, first computer 2007. And then uh, I began to be able to have transfer files from the uh, get them oh, transfer them over from uh, to uh, uh, to uh, digital from the uh, just the slides themselves and put them on USB drives. And then I began to develop and learn about Photoshop because I got all those how I can go. Particularly, that's what I use uh, Photoshop to uh, go in and play around with art images and stuff and, and, and things like that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now your your son and your daughter are they also into design? Well, my daughter, she's a spoken word. She's a teacher, and uh, at oh. that same time, she's a writer, and she does the spoken words, and she has her own uh, publication out that she's done, uh, in a little small publication right now, that she, which has been received very well, called I Twirl in the Smoke, and her name is Maricia Gabrielle. It's a, okay. uh, poems and spoken words that she does, and so it's been highly received wherever she's done presentations. Because she done presentations with me when I was in Chiapas uh, in 2012, did a presentation there to introduce me when I was did a, a 20 minute historical uh, uh, retrospective on my involvement with the Black Panther Party during the uh, conference that they had on reflection and analysis. Mm-hmm. So, um, what, tell tell me kind of what what's the design? I guess since you've seen it from the the 60s really to now, and and I don't know, you can tell me how involved you are. What sort of the design? community like in San Francisco? Because I think for us on the outside, we see it mostly in terms of just technology and Silicon Valley and stuff like that. But what's what's the design community like for you, and how has it changed over the years? Well, basically, I'm telling you the truth, I, I, I haven't been really, except for those who have uh, been just deeply involved, I have been deeply involved in that community. But I see, I, you can see that it's all basically commercial. Uh, com, it's, uh, yeah. with, with, it's a lot of commercial stuff. But you got the uh, also got the uh, street art and the stuff that's very vibrant here. I'm quite sure maybe as well there, you know. But that's what you, you know. You see a lot of that, you know. But the whole dynamics has changed now in the, in regards to uh, you know you, you, the whole bit. You, what you have now, I find, is that because of the status of the street artists and the, all those artists. That, uh, they try to integrate more of that into the uh, into the museums and into the galleries mm-hmm. because they see there's a great market for that, you know, and what have you. But uh, and, and you know, I, that was the same thing when I first did my first um, presentation at MoCA. Uh, a lot of people came to the museum for the presentation that you normally didn't go to gallery. So that opened it up. So when the request was made to do the uh, about doing the exhibit there. They've seen a whole new audience. Mm-hmm. And so, and yeah, and so that's what has happened, you know. So, but the design, is, you know, it's, it's here. People have the spirit now of uh, the, just the creative spirit to do as they choose. You have, you have a lot of, you got a tourist alley here in the, in the, uh, in the I forgot the name of it, but right here in the uh, Mission District. 
which is one of the most diverse communities in San Francisco, where tourists come through because you got all kind of artists who come through and paint. You know, people mm-hmm. have to paint on the house and stuff, and, well, and uh, what have you. They got several. They got four or five of them like that here in in, in the Mission District in San Francisco. You know, so from that perspective, uh, um, but I couldn't tell you about too much about the gallery because I don't identify. I don't not say don't identify with. I just don't have have too much dealings with them except on uh, uh, when I'm requested. You know. Stuff right. like that in the travels and stuff, yeah. Okay. So the the design community, just I'm going to just say overall, there's always this sort of perennial discussion around uh, diversity in the design just profession and in this industry. And really, you're someone that is a, a pioneer in this, not just in terms of design, but also, I guess, design as, as a progressive artist, so to speak. I don't know if that would be a good way to put it. You can tell me. <laughs> but I got think of, of when I think of influential American artists that have had an impact, I think, like Romare Bearden, Andy Warhol, Norman Rockwell, you. Uh, and then, like, maybe if there's someone current, it would possibly be Shepard Ferry that did the kind of Obama Hope woodcuts. I think even now he skews more more commercial. Um, what are what What sort of, I guess, opinions or thoughts do you have about kind of diversity in this profession? Well, um, I mean, that, that, that the, the diversity comes from people who do not try to, to duplicate something that someone has already done, but comes from the fact that they can be inspired by what someone has done and maybe uh, can enhance that in a way that it hasn't been done in, in the past. It can be more stimulating or what have you, broaden it to another dimension in, the, in uh-huh. as regards to the art itself, or the image itself, or the visual itself. So uh, from that perspective, that's the only way I can communi- communicate that clarity for myself to you. Right. So going back uh, to the kind of the eight-hour mindset that you talked mm-hmm. about, uh, I think that for students, it's it's interesting because if they're, they're in art school and they're kind of sort of deciding – how they're going to go after they graduate. And it, it can be easy to get into that eight-hour mindset where you feel like you're only a designer, you know, during, I don't know, from nine to five or something like that. And you said that even when you switched from the party to working for the Sun Reporter, you had people that instead of being in it for the passion, they kind of were just in it, you know, during the day so they could get a check. Yes, yes. And, and that's the whole thing. My mindset is basically – uh, starts from the college. The college is there. You're going for the purpose of to, to enhance your skills for the purpose of employment as a mm-hmm. job and not as a person to be committed to. You, you commit, Once you get a job, you become committed or you or you become a slave to the corporation or whatever you work for. You're not independent and what have you. So that's the whole mindset. And then, at, you know, and this, there's uh, so that's what carries on in the relationship from, from the college into the workplace. Uh, uh, when you do, do get a job, so you, you understanding that you have to be able to, if you've been experienced, been around it, and evaluated what you've done, you, you figure out how you can work through that process or that mindset, so that people can become more inspired by doing what they do, and it can sometimes it's uh it's, it can work as good, and, and you make the achieve and success, and sometimes you, you you don't, you know, but you just so that's what I carry that over with me from being in the party uh, mm-hmm. and and what have you, because we had many discussions and critiques and evaluation of uh, what we did to improve the, the quality of what we done with what we had to work with. So that was uh, always uh, a, a, a benchmark in relationship to how we did things. Uh, so you try to carry that with you after the uh, demise of the party into the uh, um, into into just going back into uh, a, a, a place where you got a nine to five job and people there just you know they could care less to just get things done to get through so you have to you have to uh, continue to keep your focus and how you do things and hopefully that plays an impact and rub off on others who are around you as well and how they do things and you you know you try you can you can't give critique and suggestions in the way you did because uh, you're dealing with the temperaments and all these other things, uh, and uh, you know, that come into play. So, I got you. So let's talk about about you right now. You're you're a you're a grandfather. Is that right? 
Uh, yes, I have four granddaughters. Yes. Wow. Daughter has, yeah, yeah, my daughter has two. My son has two. Yes. Okay. Yeah, ages from nine to twenty-one. All right. You're your grandfather. You're an uh, accomplished American artist. What 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 sort of motivates and inspires you now? Is it the same kind of passion that you had when you were in the party, or has it changed? Oh yeah. Years? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But this is in the garage to keeping up with what's going on, current events, and what's going on in the world. All those things, and trying to decide how I can uh, interpret that and uh, and and get some insight through my art on these things. So I and uh, you know I had a, used to have a list of stuff that I usually work off of when I started this whole uh, aspect, this part of the journey of mm -hmm. social issues I would work on and stuff like that. And I and and, and try to create from that list of things uh, then. And so that's the same now. So yeah, okay. I deal with a lot of political issues, a lot of social concerns issues like HIV AIDS, uh, dealing with the, uh, the war, you know, in my work, drone warfare also in the work, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the the, the, the gang, the, the violence, the, the one the less than one percent gang bang violence that goes on in the community, all those things. Uh, I deal with in well, the uh, prison industrial complex, all that. So even things like say like stop and frisk or yes. or stand your ground and stuff like that. Yeah, that would you 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 could say that yeah because it's all interconnected and linked. So many, many okay. Ways, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, if you weren't, and this this might be a hard question to answer, if you weren't doing design, which it kind of seems like you've been doing all your life, if you weren't doing that, what do you think you would be doing? Well, if I weren't doing design, and if, if I and I was a designer and weren't doing design. I would probably, like I did when I wasn't doing design, when I was taking care of family and stuff, uh, I always kept my art materials ac accessible and there so I wouldn't uh, become rusty or stale or even forget about it, you know, mm -hmm. for a period of time. So, But if, if I weren't doing design, uh, I don't know, I couldn't say what I would be doing right now in regards okay. to, yeah. Are there any... But I'm happy with the fact that uh, at some point, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I know that the, some, at some point in in the in the near future, <laughs> at some point <laughs> or in the in the future, I'll be an, an ancestor. So I'm just trying to achieve what I can at this point, uh, while my mind is still good and, my, and sharp and what have you. Uh, so right. uh, yeah, so that's basically leave that that legacy. Yes, hopefully it'll be something that be constructive and inspiring. I'm I'm pretty sure it is. I mean, it already is. I don't I don't think <laughs> I don't think you have to do too much work on that. I think it all the work that you've done already uh, stands out. And I mean, it's, it's just such a crucial part of, of visualizing what the civil rights movement was. Uh, I can't think of of really any other artist that that I can't I can't think of any other artist that has has really sort of I don't know galvanized calcified that that uh, that. Oh, I'm I'm getting tongue tied about you know what I'm what I'm saying here. That that sort of has has taken that that uh, that feeling and created this visual mythology around it mm -hmm. uh, for such a current you know time. I, I don't know any other artist that has has done it to that effect. Are, are there any current artists uh, that you admire? Well, you know, I there are quite a few, but I just never get into name because y'all would leave somebody out. And that, right, right, right. You know, so I try not to do that. <laughs> I got but you. Yeah, okay. those, and there, you know, those are coming up young artists too. In my travels, mm -hmm. you see a lot of young artists who come out inspired, uh, inspired by the work you do, and you see the work that they're doing. So you know, you see that, you know, uh, a lot, and you see it in a lot of places where you thought that you might not see it, you know, in certain institutions, you know, because I was in one is I was invited to Princeton School of Art and Design, and that's in uh, that was in uh, uh, Amsterdam. And okay. They used, and they usually invite somebody. From in the world, from but not from here. He's from Africa or Asia or Latin America, and they knew of the work that I've done, and they wanted me to come. So I uh, told them I would come, but also I always request, if whenever I can, that if I can go into the community and get have some kind of communication with young people, so I can know what's going on. Uh -huh. And so they arranged that as well. But I went to the art school, and this one department I went up to, to uh, where they invited me to. You had honors from different parts of, because uh, I, I just thought the whole school was about fashion and all that kind of stuff. But you had other people there. Other, this department had students from Asia, Africa, Brazil, and what have you. And I seen a young a man there who was working on the project and done a lot of research dealing with the, the melting of the glaciers, what was happening with that. 
I seen a young lady from Myanmar, Myanmar, who was working on the politics and stuff that was going on there. A uh, young lady from China, a person from China was doing work on hers, her project as well. And then I walked down the hallway as I was leaving, after I did a presentation and we tied it up and the whole bit. Uh, this young man had this uh, poster on his wall of the, what's the brother that was recently killed uh, uh, in the lecture chair down there? In, uh, Troy Davis. Yeah. He said, I am Troy Davis, too. And he was from Brazil. He had a big art wow. poster. Yeah. So, you know, so you, you get the sense that they are, they are the young people in these institutions who are who are very conscious and are stating, making these statements with their art. Mm -hmm. But it just has to be a, a bit more exposure and I'll, just in the departments themselves. Because maybe you got progressive-minded, open-minded people who are teaching at these schools, but they got to be able to get it out there into the uh, real world more so than just mm -hmm. on the uh, just in the institutions themselves. And you know, but uh, so in that sense, I see hope. I see I see hope and uh, and uh, the possibilities of. And, I mean, everywhere you go, everywhere I go, there are young people who are inspired, particularly the street artists and those. Uh, you see out there doing the, the the mural paintings and what have you because mm -hmm. they, yeah you see a lot of it there. Have there been any? Uh, and I'll just say, have there been any HBCUs, any black colleges uh, here in no, the state that have reached out to you for that kind of thing? No, no, but they have. Uh, they some of the students from those black colleges come to presentations. I do, but they haven't okay. been in black colleges yet. No, uh, I think the only one was when I was in the uni when I was in the Black Panther Party, and that was at Fisk University then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but none. I haven't been asked about Howard University, but uh, that was a while back, you know, stuff like that. So right now, with the economy being the way it is, I don't know if they can even pay for the transportation, you know, to get there. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's real. That's that's real. Yeah. Um, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because uh, mm -hmm. uh, just recently NPR did this. They were doing this interview talking about. It was more so about blacks and technology, and it was a summit at Stanford where they were uh, the HBCU Innovation Summit. And I think a large part of it was about technology, and perhaps it also was about uh, design and things like that. But it was how HBCUs can be, uh, I guess, more important in the 21st century. And it's funny that you, you mentioned that. Uh, I went to Morehouse, and when I think of, of art just in and around the Atlanta University Center, Spelman generally comes to mind because they have uh, an art gallery on the campus, the, the, the Manly Art Gallery. I might be <laughs> messing the name up, but uh, yeah. no, I, I think that's that's uh, that's a that's a telling point. Yeah, yeah, but not only that, you may have you may have students there who have been interested, but because of the the, uh, the, the politics of, in the art of some of the artwork, they may, the administration may not think otherwise too. Right. You because know, uh, black colleges are very conservative in most cases overall. Uh, that's true. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And so you got you're looking at that as well, you know, because I, I'm, you know, I critique Obama just like I critique Nixon, you know, in my artwork, mm -hmm. you know, and so what have you. So you know, and and then the, you know, you got uh, also the black colleges, man. They are, it, 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 the administration, I mean, that's where you got all these uh, these people, come, blacks coming into the military, into that out of them black colleges, yeah, and stuff like that. You got them, you know, recruiters on there, and for you know. So you got a lot of dynamics there in relationship to the, uh, the you know, a lot of philosophical perspectives of the institutions themselves. Now I'm quite sure if you got some where you got a strong um, student body, I'm quite sure they could, if they chose to, could bring people in who are talking about and dealing with uh, uh, things that are counter to what they're about. You know what I'm saying? In many mm -hmm. ways, of course, I'm quite sure in the classes the have these discussions and things dynamics going on, but as far as the bringing in artists and stuff like that, I, I'm I'm not uh, you know I only only myself I was, I was like there have been teachers and stuff who in the past talked about coming to Howard, coming to going to Howard University and other other places you know and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I was just in 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 um, New Orleans you know, and there were students who came from the black colleges there because I okay. had, I was just down there and they had a, a um, uh, for for alumni uh, uh, thing with the uh, former BPP members, but mm -hmm. also there was the uh, McKinnon Gallery M Museum there who wanted to do an exhibit. So we did a, uh, a 25 uh, print ex 
exhibit there, and they had uh, many students who came from one of the black colleges who came to the uh, presentation itself. And they were involved with the uh, Wick Museum in relationship to framing and putting them together so they could be exhibited. exhibited you know. So the consciousness of the students is one thing. It's the, uh, it's the institution themselves is another. You know. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I, I, yeah, I went to a black college, graduated from a black college, and and it's, now that you mentioned that, yeah, HBCUs tend to be really conservative, and I wonder if, in some instances, they're getting in students' own way of, you know, kind of moving the needle forward. Oh, yeah. Well, I really yeah, think so in some cases. Yeah, yeah, it frames their whole mindset, outlook on, you know, in relationship to the real world, you know. Yeah. And what, yeah. And so that, it does in many, many ways, yes. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give for, I guess, any progressive artists that might be listening? That, or I would say even not progressive artists, but people that might be interested in, in communicating social issues more through their work. Well, first, if they have, they have to be uh, researched. You have to basic understand the basic issues that they're dealing with. One mm -hmm. and their work. Uh, two, they have to be able to uh, be able to deal with the constructive uh, or cr critiquing of their work by others. Uh, if they choose to, they can make uh, adjustments. If they choose not to, they don't have to. But, you know, but they have to be open to those kinds of things, you know. And they have to be, uh, you know, those are some of the basic things that I, w I would, uh, I would uh, suggest to them in regards to the basic, uh, you know, doing work and, and to continue to be inspired by what they're doing. You know, you have to be inspired, you know. I mean, it can be ups and downs. It ain't, everything ain't rosy, you know, all the time. Right, <laughs> so, right. Yeah, so you have to be able to uh, stay focused and not get deterred, you know, and from what you do, you know. And, and also notice the fact that you, you, it ain't necessarily going to make a lot of money. <laughs> you know, you ain't going to get rich doing this stuff, you know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's the other thing as well, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where can our audience find you online? Uh yeah, I'm uh you can I'm, I'm I guess right now I'm developing my face I got a Facebook page. And okay. My name is, yeah, Emory Douglas. It, it, it's it's my and it's got my daughter has one, but the one that people come to is the one where it's got the image of the uh, artwork I did across the top and, and where you have the word peace being attacked by missiles. Okay. So they, it's a blue one with the word peace being attacked by missiles. And gotcha. so uh, that, yeah, and I'm working on my uh, on an online store site, which I'm, I've been working on for the past uh, year. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it may or may not get out, you know, soon, uh, hopefully soon, sooner than later, you know. But uh, then, you know, if you Google, if you Google the name because of the way things set up now, everything is out there where I travel and stuff like that. People want to see that. They can find that just by Googling my name. Because yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of the stuff out there, you know, stuff that I didn't realize was on there myself that's there from the various travels and stuff like that. So, if, But if they want to get contact, contact me directly, they can come through uh, Facebook or they can come okay. through the site that you got contacted me through, uh, Kali, which is the young man I did this, uh, the skateboards with, collaboration. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Emory Douglas, it has been a, a pleasure talking with a pioneer of, of graphic design here in America. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure and honor. I appreciate it. All right. Okay. And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Emory Douglas and thanks to you for listening. We'll have a short interview next week, then we're back to our regular interview starting in February. Revision Path is a 318 media project. If you like what we're doing with these podcasts, you can help sponsor the show. Contact information will be included in the show notes. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.